Now, what daily practices could a sincere Christian follow to enhance their worship and their soul development toward God? Yeah, I thought this was a pretty good question because it, 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 there are some number of daily practices that can help any person. Mm. And, and, I, and I feel these daily practices apply to all people on mm. the planet, not just to Christians. Mm. Mm. But let's, let's look at uh, two, the first two of them. If you, if you, in the Bible, uh, there is a record of me saying, what are the two greatest commandments? Can you remember them? Uh, love, your God, love God with the whole heart, your whole soul, your whole being, yeah. your whole mind. <laughs> all your strength. Yeah. And all your strength. Yeah. And to love your neighbour as yourself. Right. So, so if we firstly look at these two particular things mm. as daily practices, what would it mean to you to love God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, your whole strength? You, can you see that you can't love somebody you don't know? Mm. Like, so, so my first uh, recommendation to any person is to get to know God, not to get to know the God of the Bible, because mm. I don't believe that is God, mm. and I never have believed that mm. is God. Even in the first century, I didn't believe what the Bible said in the Old Testament was everything there was to know about God. Yes. And in fact, I knew based on God being God of love, that a lot of what the Old Testament said about God being God of wrath was obviously <laughs> false. Yeah. So, so how do I get to know God? That, that becomes my uh, a primary question. Now, my answer to that is by engaging in my day-to-day -day life the fascinating things that God has presented me in God's universe that demonstrate God's nature to me. Mm. That's how I do it. Mm. So how I do it is I... As I look around myself, as I'm working out in the garden, and I look at all the different things and I learn about them, and, and I ask myself this under, underlying fundamental question, what does this tell me about the character, nature and attributes of God? Because everything does. Yeah. Everything tells me something about God. Now, this helps me get to know God. I would also engage conversation with people who I believe knew more of the laws of God than I do. And I would reflect upon what these laws tell me about God. And whether the laws are false or true, you know, whether the person believes them fundamentally or not. Mm. So, so, for example, there are some laws uh, that uh, people present in Christianity that if I analyse them and, I care and carefully, I go, wow, it's really telling me that God's misogynistic. Uh, you know, a woman hater. <laughs> now, is that what I believe God to be? Or is that what a God of love would be? You see, and it help. So even, even learning the false thing about God can help me see the truth about mm, God. Mm. That's the beauty of doing this. So what I'd encourage people to do as a daily practice is to ask themselves the questions about whatever they hear, whatever knowledge they garner from the universe around them, whatever they observe, what does it tell me about God? Yeah. Then I can get to know God. Mm. If I can get to know God, then I can come to love God. Mm. Right? So then I'm not just focused on receiving love from God. Mm -hmm. I'm focused on also feeling love from mm -hmm. God. Right? That's what a relationship is. A relationship isn't you just loving me, you loving me, and me just ignoring you. Mm. <laughs> That's not a relationship. <laughs> now, God has that kind of relationship with the majority of people on the planet, mm -hmm. where God's trying, wanting to have a relationship with every one of his children, and most of the children reject the relationship. And even most, a lot of Christians reject the relationship mm -hmm. because they're not engaging this permanent connection yes. with God. They're, yes. they're having, trying to have a relationship with God through a book, mm. not through their own personal experience. So what I'm suggesting, and what I suggested in the first century was identical to this, get to know God through the universe around you. Get to know God by looking at everything and asking yourself the question, what does this tell me about God? So that's number one practice. Mm. In, in fact, if you just did that one practice, mm -hmm. you'd learn a lot about love, a lot about truth, a lot about yourself through the whole process, mm -hmm. just that one practice. But I'm going to recommend four more practices. <laughs> <laughs> but that, to me, is one of the primary yeah. ones, getting to know the person who created you, your, your parent, your mm -hmm. true parent. The second one is recommended by that statement that you made from the Bible, which is to love your neighbour as yourself. So once I've learned what God's nature is towards myself in terms of love, then I act the way God would act in the situation towards others. 
Mm. And I value the other person as much as, but not more, than myself. Mm -hmm. And I value mm -hmm. the other person as little as, but not as uh, in, in the opposite direction. So, yes. so in other words, what I'm saying is I value the other person as equal to me, mm. not as less mm -hmm. and not as more than mm. me. All right? Now, a lot of faith encourages to put ourselves down mm. and value the other person more than mm. ourselves. Mm. This will always result in equality of some kind. So, for example, if you look at some of the Bible verses, they encourage women to value the husband more than themselves through this aspect of headship of the male. If you look at Paul's writings, they're basically saying that he does not permit a woman to speak in the congregation. Does he permit a man to speak in the congregation? Why, yes, he does. So why doesn't he permit a woman to speak in the congregation? Now, of course, Paul never said that. It was later on added uh -huh. to the Bible. But if we looked at it and we said, OK, this is a point of inequality. Mm -hmm. If I love my neighbour as myself, then I will love a woman as much as I love myself as a man. Mm -hmm. If I value my own input in a congregation, then surely I would also value the woman's input in the congregation. If I feel that I should be able to be a minister of a congregation, then surely a woman should also, if I value the woman as much as a man, if I love my neighbour as myself, mm -hmm. I should be able to allow the woman to also be a minister of a congregation. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Quite clear. Yes. Yes. However, if I start choosing scriptures in the Bible, there will be many scriptures that disagree mm. with that. Mm. But if you look at my statement, which is I must love my neighbour as myself, I would not value the woman as lesser than myself, nor would I expect, put restrictions upon her that I would not place on myself. And also vice versa. As a woman, I would not think that the man is greater than myself or think that I should have more restrictions placed on myself mm. than the man has placed on himself. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this aspect of loving the neighbour as equal to yourself, mm. as yourself, yes. is a very important aspect to practice in your day-to-day -day life. It will help you determine so much truth. It will help you dismiss many of the so-called sacred writings of all sorts of books because they are in, they, are, they promote inequality. Mm. They promote either looking at a person who's greater or lesser than yourself. You see the same problem historically mm. with Christianity and other faiths where, where certain races of mankind were treated worse than other races based on whether they were cursed or not. So there is this underlying uh, justification of the, of the uh, slave trade during the 1800s based mm. upon the scriptures about, you know, Noah's, one of Noah's sons being That's cursed right. mm -hmm. and him being more black or dark than the others. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it was cursed because of his colour. And, and the law of love of my neighbour as myself would instantly dismiss that mm -hmm. justification mm -hmm. as false. Mm -hmm. Because if I love my neighbour as myself, I would love my black neighbour as myself mm. and my, if we can call them, Asian, Asian neighbour yes. or yellow neighbour, sometimes they refer to, although I don't understand why, <laughs> um, as myself. Uh, and any tribal differences mm. that I would have would instantly disappear mm. because I love my neighbour as myself mm. as a practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would never go to war mm. because I would never want somebody Mm. to go to war with me. And any resistance you may have against any, any person at all, you feel the resistance, you immediately realise that that's the you damage knew. within yourself. Exactly. And to deal with that. Exactly, and that's where humility comes yeah. in, which yeah. is my next practice. <laughs> <laughs> so the next daily practice is to practice becoming more and more humble mm. each day. You see, it's no good recognising these truths about God and in fact, you won't be able to recognise mm. truths about God or recognise truths about your neighbour unless you're humble to change yourself. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a whole set of belief systems inside of yourself that through this interaction with God and your neighbour you realise can't be true, 
if you were humble, you'd give them up. Mm. It doesn't matter whether they were written in a book or not, mm. you'd still give them up. Mm. You wouldn't hold on for dear mm. life and resist them and even fight for them. Mm. You would give them up quite readily. And this is why the daily practice of humility is so important. Understanding what humility is. Humility is a lot about allowing yourself to feel your own emotions without perpetrating unloving acts towards others. Yes. Allowing yourself to realise conflicts in your own belief systems without perpetrating unloving acts towards others. Mm. Allowing yourself to see that you're probably going to have to change on one or two or more, most probably, mm. subjects. Mm. Probably many thousands in the mm. end of subjects. And that change is something that you're going to have to get used to. Mm. Humility allows yep. you to see these things. Yep. And also having the humility to see that no single book can contain mm. the infinity of God mm. within its pages. So mm. humility would dictate that as well, the seeing of this particular knowledge. So that would be my third daily practice, mm. humility. Practicing humility. Yes. Practicing feeling your own feelings rather than trying to blame other people yeah. for, for your feelings. Yeah. Feeling, you know, how you're responding and seeing it as a, whether it's in and out of harmony with love. And if your response is out of harmony with love, seeing there must be an underlying cause that you need to address yeah. inside of yourself and, and being willing to address it. Yeah. Not ignore it, not, not run away from it, not, mm. not, not say it was somebody else's fault, mm. but mm. rather look at what's going on inside of yourself. Mm. So that would be my third daily practice. Humility opens you up to truth. Yes. So truth is my fourth daily practice, okay. a quest for truth. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is to begin to pray not for things in the Bible or things in the Koran or things in, the, in any other holy book to be true, but rather to pray to know God's truth mm -hmm. in your heart. And humility will help you see it when mm. it is presented to mm. you. Right? So, that, so humility, in a way, is like a doorway that opens yourself to truth. And truth is the doorway to seeing what love is all about and actually feeling love in the end. So truth is a very important, and the, the quest for truth cannot be underestimated. And this is why I said to, to, that the truth will set mm. you free. It's not love that results in freedom. Freedom and love are the end result of the quest for truth. Okay. Right? And being humble enough to see it. Okay. Right? And, uh, and this quest for truth will enable love to be experienced. You see, if we're holding on to false beliefs, we cannot connect with truth at all. And in fact, you know, the Christian belief of connecting to the Holy Spirit, as we will discuss mm. later, is true. But we cannot even connect to the Holy Spirit if we do not have a quest for truth. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth in, in a lot of ways. It, 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 it only connects with the human soul when we have a desire for truth mm. to enter our soul. Mm. And so... Um, the aspect of opening our heart to truth and praying for truth is very, very important. And not being afraid to put things in the I don't know basket. Mm. In other words, not being afraid to say, I don't know the truth about this yet. Yeah. To be honest, there are billions of things in this universe that none of us know. Yeah. Well, you think about it from a Absolutely. perspective of mathematics, if the universe is infinite or if God is infinite, then it then it makes sense that God has created a universe that potentially with a whole heap of laws that are infinite. And if that's the case, then I'm not going to know them all. Mm. Right? So I have to expect that almost everything in the universe is in the I don't know basket. Mm. And it's only through my process of discovery, through the process of love, knowing God, getting to know God's nature, God's attributes, God's qualities, learning to treat my neighbour as equal to myself and love my neighbour as myself, that I'll start to be able to determine what, through the law of love, what truth may be. And once I do that, I will be able to experiment with the truth and then it will solidify within myself once I've experimented. But not from somebody telling me. Mm. It'll be through my own and personal experiments with the truth. Yep. Then I can take the thing out of the I don't know basket and put it in I know for certain mm. this is true or in the I know for certain it is false baskets. Mm -hmm. That's when we can do it. So th this aspect of desire for truth, 
I feel needs to be a daily practice. I feel the majority of people are very, very happy with the truth they feel they already know. And as a result, they no longer have a quest for mm. more truth. Mm. The problem with a finite book is that it encourages mm. such belief. It does too, yes. Because it tells you that if it's not there, then it's not true. Mm. And that is not logical when it comes to God's nature or Absolutely. attributes. But it is also not logical for our future because we're going to be then controlled by the finite limitations of the book we're reading mm. and believing to be true. Mm. So I, I would definitely say to people, this quest for eternal truth, this eternal quest for truth, mm. for, for, for infinite truth, is something that we must engage. Mm. Only God knows absolute truth. So it makes sense that if I develop a relationship with God, that truth will come to me more readily than if I do not develop a relationship mm. with God. Mm. Some very many famous people, scientists and otherwise in history, have had a relationship with God and as a result received truth through that relationship. Mm. And then the other practice, which I feel is probably the most important practice of them all. Pray every day to receive God's love into your heart. Mm. Now this practice is very dependent on the other practices yes. you know, in some ways being engaged. But prayer in itself is a very, very interesting operation. Because what prayer does, and most people in this are not aware of this, even most Christians who pray and most Muslims and others who pray, if a prayer is sincere and from the heart, what it does is it opens the heart to love and truth. It actually has the physical operation of opening your soul mm. and allowing new things to enter the soul. Mm. And in particular, what it does is it, it, it establishes a connection between your soul and God's soul. And now things can flow wow. from God's soul into your soul as long as the prayer remains. The prayer is a longing, passionate desire, mm. not an intellectual mm. word. Mm. So it's no good me five times a day praying towards the sun, maybe as, or I think it's five times a day, praying toward, towards, the, towards the east for God's, for, for, towards God, or as a Christian might do, saying a rosary or all those kind of things. If, if our mind is just engaged and our heart is not engaged, Absolutely. it has no effect on the soul. Yeah. For prayer to have an effect on the soul, it, we need to feel it as a feeling towards God, mm. as a feeling and emotion, emotional, passionate state towards God. So we need to learn how to pray. And to learn how to pray isn't just write, reading off from a book or reading off from some kind of text a prayer towards God. Learning how to pray is about having feelings mm. towards God. Mm of wanting and desiring mm. certain things that are pure in their nature, love of God being one of them, the primary one, and truth from God being a secondary one, and humility being a third. Yes. So, so if we long towards God for these particular things every single day and we spend time, give ourselves time that are apart from all of our day-to-day -day pressures where we just have this time with God, where we long for God's love and we long for God's truth and we long to become more humble people as a practice, not because it's a rote practice, but because it's a heartfelt sure. desire, then we will find we will grow in love immensely mm. and also to be, to be able to determine truth much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. And then all this stuff that's in the I don't know basket can be rapidly put yes. into the false basket or true basket mm. because my heart, as it becomes more and more full of love from God, I have the ability to determine what love is mm. Mm. and therefore the ability to decide what truth may be because mm. mm. truth is always loving. Mm. So I have the ability to determine truth as a result. But if love does not exist in my heart and I don't have a desire for it and I don't have a longing to receive it from God, then I will not have the ability to determine truth. Yeah, yeah. I'll only have my intellect and mm. my own, own unhealed emotional mm. condition to determine truth. Now, how about the reading of poetry and of other, other, other literature 
say, to actually trigger that desire for God? Well, if after, the, after those five practices I've mentioned you have time left, <laughs> <laughs> and I suggest probably most people in the Western world wouldn't have much time left after those practices, then sure, do mm. anything that inspires mm. you. Mm. Do it, and, and in fact, do anything you possibly can to engage your will in a more forceful manner, in yes. a more firm manner and direct manner. Yes. And, and engage the things that inspire you. But, but to be honest, you will find that happening automatically if yeah. you do those prior yeah. five practices I've mentioned. Now, this is where you would actually, because somebody has actually asked this question about the use of will. This is where you put your will into practice about using those practices. Yes, well, That's one of where... the primary gifts of love mm. is God's gift of free will to mm. us. Like, if you think about it, it is one of the most powerful gifts to be able to ever give to a creation that you've created. Mm. It's like what God has done is said, right, I'm going to create this creation, but instead of this creation doing what I want it to do, I want this creation to engage what it be. Yes, yes. Now, the beauty of that <clears throat> is remarkable because basically what you're doing is you're you're giving up control mm -hmm. of the very creature you have made. Mm -hmm. And God has done that. Mm. God has given up the control of the very creature mm. God has made. Instead, God has placed a system, a, a structure, if you like, in the universe of laws. Now, the, the creature God has created, and we are the only creature God has created that can do this, can break the law or live by it by choice mm. and God's given us this beautiful will to decide what we wish to do. Now many of us decide to break the law every day and God doesn't punitively come along and say you naughty boy you've broken the law. God knew right from the beginning by giving you free will that you had the ability to break law. God gave you the ability mm. to break the law if you so desire. But God has also given you the ability, through the same ability, to live in harmony with the law. Mm -hmm. And when we live in harmony with the law, when we use our will in harmony with law, it results in happiness. And it also results in no restrictions. Mm -hmm. So as long as we use our will in harmony with the laws of love every single day, we will have no restrictions placed upon us. We will not grow old. Mm -hmm. We will not get sick. We will not have diseases. We don't need to die, right? The reason why all those things happen that I've just mentioned is because we've broken a whole series of laws of love, mm -hmm. which all have their own consequences for mm -hmm. their break, for, mm -hmm. for breaking them. And if we understood better the use of our will in harmony with all of God's laws, which are loving, then the majority of people on the planet wouldn't avoid using their will in that direction so much. Yeah. yeah. And it also is proof that every religion on this planet that exists today is breaking the law of God in some way. Mm. Because the adherents of such religions do grow old. Mm. They do die. They do get sick. They do have diseases. Mm. Which is all proof that the law is being broken somehow. Yeah. And even those people who believe the Bible is God's word are following the Bible to the letter or to probably better said to the interpretation of the letter, they still get sick, they still grow old and they die, mm. which is an indication they must be still breaking at least one or more of the laws of God that are obviously not contained in the Bible because if they were contained in the Bible, then the person wouldn't have grown old and mm. wouldn't have got sick and couldn't have died. Does that make sense? Yeah, most definitely. So, so the consequences, of what we see what's happening in the universe is a direct reflection of the fact that our day-to-day -day practices are flawed. Mm. And my suggestion is if we bring them back to those five basic practices each day and, and, and we engage our will in a passionate way to follow those particular practices, our entire life will rapidly change. We will receive divine love. We have the potential of becoming immortal, of living forever as a result of becoming at one with God only via, by engaging these practices. Any other practice we do, so we can, we can sit down and talk about doctrines until we're blue in the face, mm. it will not help us 
one bit in mm. gaining a condition of one with God. Mm. It may help us to determine truth and error at some point perhaps, but unless we engage these principles of love in our life, it, it is impossible. And unless we receive divine love into our soul, it's going to be impossible for us to ever to become a one with God, no matter what we believe, mm. Mm. no matter what practices we engage, no matter what doctrines we, we firmly believe in our heart of truth. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what the other practices I'd recommend. Oh, fabulous.